There is a belief for some rooted in thousands of stories, a belief rooted for others in science, and for others, it isn't a belief at all, rather a fact, something they absolutely know is real because they've seen it stand before them. There is a place in Northern California. This place is unique. This place is host to a series of strange and popularized events that occurred in the late 1950s into the early 70s. When logging crews came back from the local mountains and into town, they told stories of strange footprints, overthrown heavy machinery, and reported sightings of humanoid creatures that lived in the wild. It was 1958, and Jerry Crew must have found himself puzzled. He was part of a crew building a road near the Bluff Creek area, and kept finding large footprints that his Hoopa native workers insisted were from a large hairy giant. He finally cast one, a Eureka journalist, wrote a front page report about it, and the article was picked up nationally. Bigfoot had arrived. Over the next decade, many came and went looking for what made these tracks. Expeditions, tourists, and passerbyers put the small town of Willow Creek on the map. But the most important story truly begins hundreds of miles away in Washington, as rodeo cowboy and Bigfoot researcher Roger Patterson combed the mountainsides of Mount St. Helens for three weeks. He and friend Bob Gimlin were on the hunt for what Patterson believed to be some kind of caveman. Tired and empty-handed, they returned home, only to learn that what they had been looking for had been causing quite the stir in Six Rivers National Forest. Three sets of footprints, all different in size, were being repeatedly found by a logging crew, and full barrels of gas had been picked up and thrown into the creeks. Despite being fresh off the trail and back to the real world, the stars lined up just right for both Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin. With Roger receiving some expedition funding from his brother-in-law and Bob working the tail end of his seasonal job, they packed up the horses and headed deep into the heart of the Six Rivers National Forest. Once there, the two spent several nights over campfires listening to Roger play recordings of witnesses he had interviewed describing their sighting. They spent their days looking for any sign of these giants. They rode all day, every day. It wasn't until the late afternoon of October 20th, 1967, that all of their effort would be redeemed. Exhausted and nearing the end of their trip, they rode up Bluff Creek. They came across a downed tree with a large root system impeding their view of what lie ahead. And when they turned the corner, Despite falling off of his horse, Roger Patterson still managed to grab his camera. He took chase to the creature, down an embankment, through the creek, up an embankment, and despite the camera turning off six times, Roger flipped it back on and managed to capture the creature on film. Quickly losing sunlight, the two took time to cover the footprints the creature had made. Unsure if he had even captured the subject on camera, Patterson took cover under a tarp to switch out the film. The next morning, a terrible storm passed through. Bob negotiated the truck carrying the horses around muddy embankments, and despite having to reroute, they made it out. Upon leaving the area and getting back to remote civilization, Patterson was intent on meeting with Al Hodgson, a Bigfoot researcher who owned a store in Willow Creek. Patterson wanted everyone to see the trackway for themselves, touting it could not have been a hoax as there was only one set of prints and no practice runs or sign of foot stamping. Names like John Green, Al Hodgson and taxidermist Bob Titmus visited the site and concluded that the claims that Roger made were valid. 
51 years have passed. Roger Patterson died of cancer in 1972, but Bob Gimlin is alive and still telling the story of that fateful October day. The hair-covered humanoids are still being reported. It is now summer, 2019, and after years of hearing of this story over and over, I finally decided to make the 13-hour drive from Southern California to this place. This place of beauty, this place of seclusion, and the supposed home to Bigfoot. The hot and dry California Central Valley quickly gave way to mountains and endless forest. We stopped through the town of Willow Creek to gas up, headed up the Go Road to our destination, Laos Camp. Laos Camp is a well-known Bigfooters camp that has hosted nearly everyone who has ever been through these mountains to conduct their investigations. If these trees could talk, they would probably tell stories of millionaire Tom Slick, who after finding the famous Yeti footprints in the Himalayas, set up base camp here to search for its North American counterpart. Or Rene de Hinden, a no-nonsense researcher who despised the sensationalism of the subject. De Hinden spent a long portion of his life trying to debunk the Patterson film. He frustratingly accepted that the incident was authentic. As we settled into camp, it finally hit me that the stories of old were no longer stories of a place far up north, deep in the forest. These were now stories from just up the road, a short walk up the creek, and even right here at this very camp. That's when they were making the logging roads in. And, uh, and that's when Tom Slick found this, found this camp on the map from Jerry Cruz finding down there. And it wasn't, but a couple of miles up river where up creek where they had the fuel barrels stashed that right. Jerry Crew found the fuel barrels thrown into the creek too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and chimpanzee and bonobo and, and, yeah. and Billy Ape and human. You know, that's that's how that all works. And eventually the perpetualness of that monkey line died out for whatever reason. It wasn't smart enough to continue on, but the species that it spawned did. Yes. It, yeah, it was. Glenn, a Humboldt resident who spends a lot of time in these woods, met up with Jeff and I last evening. He would stay till this afternoon. You'll find him on YouTube as the Brown Dwarf. Got some eggs with Kansas City seasoning. Chipotle. I'm gonna throw it on a uh, tortilla. Before Glenn took off, we headed over to Onion Lake. This area is a watering hole for the local wildlife. It is also an area of many famous footprint finds and sightings. They weren't big, but fuck them. They're just right here. 
Hey. Like a might be bear. Like a drag. Something likes to walk right up here. What is that up on the pole over there? Over here. What's that box yeah, knocking on? I don't know, it? fucking bat box or something. There's another one over here. Over Looks there. like a bat box. Mm -hmm. No matter where you roam around Laos Camp, you can hear the voices of the creek. There were moments throughout this trip that I would not have been surprised to peek over into the creek and find a group of children splashing and playing. These sounds are not recordable by audio device. It is a simple interpretation that your brain and ears make, turning the gurgling of the creek into voices. We're right here at Laos Camp, fire rings right here. There's a drop-off right here, and running there is Bluff Creek. And uh, something that a lot of creeks do is uh, they make almost like talking noises. People swear they can hear conversations going on, and when I was standing right there, it sounded like someone was singing a song. I was getting louder, quieter, it was going up and down, and there was almost this melody to it that you could pick out. People can hear conversations going on back and forth, sometimes between male and female, sometimes two males are arguing, you know. Um, it's just the way I guess our ears perceive the babbling creeks. We did calls and knocks throughout the evening in hopes that something might be curious enough to come and check out camp. That night, something woke me up from a deep sleep, and I believe we may have had a visitor. So this is my tent right here. This is a suburban. Uh, back here, last night, it must have been I don't know, our guess is maybe 1 a.m., something like that, 1, 2 a.m. I was in a deep sleep, and I heard two loud whoops that woke me up. Jeff, when we woke up, his first question was, did you hear those two whoops? Very, very loud, and it sounded like they didn't come too far away from here. Jeff brought a hammock to camp in. He had initially set up in these two trees here, but... It was, uh, they're just too close together. So he was too low, so he actually slept in the suburban. This afternoon, I would fail to get to the Patterson-Gimlin film site. 
I decided to include the footage since it was part of the adventure and it goes to show how thick it is back there. All right, well, this ought to be the new standard for uh, getting all the way to this trailhead. We're at the Patterson Gimlin Film Site trailhead. It should be about a mile and a half going straight down, and then we'll be over to the film site. So let's go. This is the hillside that Bob Titmus had tracked Patty up around the back side of the sandbar and followed her tracks up along this ridge line. It's where she sat down and watched them as they were running the investigation on the film down on the film site. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what was that, a pheasant? Yeah. Pretty big one, too. I'll put me getting scared of a pheasant in the video, for sure. Just to give you an idea how dense this is, goes uh, my friend Jeff right there. Can't even see him. He's on the trail. There he goes. Not hard to hide out here at all. So Jeff uh, tapped out. Uh, he's knees and all just didn't allow him to so i'm on the trail by myself it's not really a trail well i guess i wasn't on the trail now i am <laughs> but uh my phone went from having good battery to five percent so i turned it off switched to my gopro it's bigfoot stuff like that that seems to happen all the time why don't you film it? Well, because my camera was low. How was your camera low? Walking these pathways and walking these creeks alone kind of give you a new perspective how thick it is in here. I don't care if they were on horseback. This is, this is pretty gnarly. <sighs> Granted, they didn't go through what I'm going through right now. Still, all right, we almost, this might be it. I cannot find this place. There's a ribbon there, a ribbon there. I don't know if this means frame one. Looking that way. And uh, Roger ran across here. She ran across over there, maybe. 
across this. I'm gonna. I just. I was just up there. I didn't see any indicators though. Keep. Here goes that famous uh, root ball. So this is what I'm guessing. We went down this way. And I believe this is the way I already said. They crossed, and boom. You see her over here at the creek, getting up and walking that way. I don't know. I've already crossed this once. I had it backwards. They came from this way. So right now I'm walking pat. I'm walking back to the trail where I initially parted ways with Jeff. They came on this side of the creek. Maybe this somewhere here is frame one because I saw some ribbon right back here somewhere. So I'll keep looking. We'll see what happens. I had failed to get to the film site. The next day, I'd find out that I was only about a minute or two away. I did, however, come to a conclusion to a question that I had always asked. I say, like, it's not till now that I understand, one, why Patty walked. She didn't feel the need to run. It's so thick back there. It's so difficult to just get across things like the creek that there was no need to, really. The master of her own domain. Yeah. If I saw someone sketchy, even here, I almost wouldn't feel the need to run. If I can, if I have a flat space right here, I can walk away whatever has between me and whatever has to. As darkness settled upon our final night at camp, I sat exhausted around the campfire. I was still hopeful to catch any wildlife on my night vision camera. It was just after sundown when the calls came bellowing down the canyon. Someone squatching on Onion Lake Road, and we just heard a Sasquatch. I see lights coming from over there. They look like car lights. I think I actually hear Our culprits had arrived at camp. And I told them then, I go, it's not looking good, but I, I put new oil in it, and, and I, I, on a cold... Uh, Rowdy Kelly of the Bluff Creek Project and his friend Greg had arrived at camp for the night. The next day, we would go to the Patterson-Gimlin film site. In the morning, during a seemingly ordinary moment while packing up camp, something strange was recorded on my camera. Something I can only describe as bizarre. This is the end of a seven and a half minute clip of us packing up camp. Jeff, Rowdy, and Greg can be seen in the background within a few steps of each other.
This is important because less than one minute later, this was recorded on my camera. The timestamp on this first video is 8.44 a.m. Aside from me, everyone in camp is together. Upon discovering this sound, I spoke to each person individually. Each person said that they didn't do any weird yells, nor did they see anyone else do any yells. The timestamp on the next clip is 8.45. Here's an enhanced version where I simply turn the volume up. The sound barely registers as an audio wave, meaning it should be quiet unless it's from a great distance away. In fact, the audio wave was so small that all attempts to add echo or reverb to it to better identify it were completely unsuccessful. The only thing manipulable were the sounds of the creek. The next clip is at 8.46 a.m., showing all campers still within a few steps of each other. Here's the sound enhanced and looped. I suspect the sound was masked by the creek flowing just behind me. It wasn't until three days later after returning from this trip that I even realized I recorded this sound. This was an outtake that was almost deleted. I'm not saying that this is Bigfoot. What I am saying is that I have no idea what made this sound. Her path, she walked around that way. Mm. All it asked through here, somewhere up through here, we call this Patty's pathway. Right here. Patty's pathway is this, Greg, what kind of what kind of sand is this? Silty sand. It's real silty, but it's this really dark gray. Yeah. Stuff doesn't like to grow in it, and it's kind of yeah. kind of kept itself on its Probably own path. Mostly, so mostly. it's interesting, it's pretty much like her path. So over there is where they were at, looking this way. We're on the back side of the frame, so right now. She's down here. They see her. He gets off his horse, gets his camera going, turns it off, runs across the creek, ends up framing, you know, the last, the famous frames, which yeah. is when he stabilizes. He gets pretty much to a bank, and he stabilizes his camera, and he finally gets some good frames, and that's where 352 came out. But our new position for that, where he was at, was down here, but mm -hmm. he was actually up here. So this bank was all the way up to here um, back in 67. It hadn't washed out. In fact, he probably ran, it was further out that way. So, but over the years, this is slowly starting to road away mm -hmm. the deposited 67 sediment. But that's where he was. The old position for Munns was right there. The but what they didn't have what? was the sight lines that we created mm -hmm. through cleaning out all these trees and making this. You couldn't see across this at all when we first got here. So it was more like this look through here. Oh, it's right. dense all the way through. Yeah. So we, we've cleared out lots of stuff to get this manageable, first of all, to walk through and to improve the fire danger down here. Because when you have that many small trees underneath, if that catches on, that'll get hot enough to get the big mm -hmm. trees. As far as what I'm looking through right here, yeah, I can see it now. I can see. You know what smiley face is? It's stump. a stump, right? 
Yeah, smiley face stump is way down there. Yeah, that's right through. So right here's the maple with a crook is right there. Zoom in on it. It's right there. And then we have the other big tree, which is this one over here. And then there's several other trees, but this one's too blown out. Where's so that one? That's this one. Oh, right. So there was an old uh, logging road over there. It wasn't very old, actually. And Bob and Roger came up this logging road right up here. And they came around a root ball. And at that time, this creek was just one uh, kind of deep cleft groove into the uh, sandbar. Because where we're standing now is what happened after the 64 flood. Deposited all this stuff out. Creek started finding its way back to the uh, pretty much the channel it's in now. Anyway, Patty was down in here uh, in the creek. So she had sound covers, she couldn't hear them coming. And she basically, they, they got the horse arousal there, got his camera going. She had already gotten up and started walking this way. Walked around here, and then ended up where frame 352 is, which is up there. I think she's probably walked right through here. This is all kind of falling off. So we used to be able to see this ground where she was at, but over the past uh, three winters now, all these trees have fallen in doing due to the erosion of this this bank right here. So what was that? What? The horse is going down that side. There's an old road side over there. They went around that side of the creek. Anyway, this is the site. This is the exact spot where Roger Patterson stabilized his camera and filmed a Sasquatch walking across a sandbar in 1967. This exact spot was lost for many years Thanks to the thousands of man hours by members of the Bluff Creek Project, this site was rediscovered. My name's Jonathan, and thanks for watching Western Bigfoot Exploration. Just twisted it right down in front of the road so we couldn't get in here no more. <laughs>